Thanks, uh, Adrian Allison from World Vision. I, I want to make two points. The first is that in Senegal, um, we've been advised by the, our program people there that we should start with the men in family planning discussions. They say to start with a woman when the power is definitely held by the men is like putting the cart before the horse. Uh, and yet I've never actually seen any family planning materials say begin with men. I think we maybe need to start a little bit of a revolution here, <laughs> starting with men. Uh, the other point I want to make is to just follow up on what Henry said so, so well um, on the cycle beads, because they're an excellent way to help people understand their own fertility. And it's really a great way to improve couple communication. We love cycle beads. But access is really horrendous problem. In India, I'm sorry, Lauren, I love you. I love IRH. However, um, in India, at the moment, as far as I know still, if you want cycle beads, you have to pay 100% of the cost up front. And World Vision cannot do that. Now, if World Vision cannot do that, who knows what is anybody else going to do? So I wonder how long the copyright exists. And, and why does our U.S. copyright laws apply to a women's cooperative in Ghana where Gladys, our Ghanaian health person, wants to have income generating projects, have women build, create cycle beads and sell them? I do just want to say it's not about the copyright. It, it really is very hard to convince any manufacturing organization to even manufacture the cycle beads. One of the issues is, is that they are not a resupply. So while it's a positive for family planning commodities because she does not have to come back and get a second dose, it is an issue for business models because it's a one-time purchase. So it's very hard to convince business operations to say, to really invest in something like this and to put in those upfront costs. Okay, yeah, no, I, I do recognize that there is e it's easy for local women to make the beads. I just do want to emphasize the point that, you know, without the quality control, it really discredits the method if there was a mistake. These are the, some of the growing pains of technology, as I, as I see it. <laughs> and, and, you know, when, when we've developed something that we've poured our hearts and souls and years of labor and research uh, into, uh, to sort of you know turn it over to somebody else who might mess it up, um, you know feels funny uh, down here too. So there's there's a lot of dimensions going on with with all of our colleagues, and I, I, I respect both sides. But I I also have this uh, as as you can tell, being an innovator and pushing the envelope a few times here and there and making it work in Bangladesh and Afghanistan. Um, that faith-based organizations do have a little bit of license to sort of you know try things out. And, and I think this, this might be a time for trying a few things and taking a careful look-see that we don't do any harm. You know, the quality and getting it messed up uh, is, is a real concern. But, but ways of looking at it that might be a little bit outside the box. And we are collectively creative people. I just want to mention that because uh, I'm, I'm just thinking in family planning, this has been the issue. For example, uh, for a long time, you know, only doctors could insert IEDs. And then way back in around 1960, I think, uh, when, was it Alan Ross was in uh, Thailand? And Alan Rosenfield, pardon me, and they had, uh, you know, only like uh, 400, 400 distrib distribution units. And so then they tried nurses, midwives actually, who could deliver babies. And it turned out that midwives could do as good a job of inserting an IUD as doctors. And so they went in one year from 400 to 4,000 uh, service delivery points. Uh, you know, this issue about quality control, I would say, okay, let's do some studies. Because you say you're concerned, I say maybe it's not a problem, we don't have the answer. That's the reason for research. So you get some women's groups to make these things around the world, uh, you give them a manual and all this, and you talk about quality control, and then you actually look. And it's a researchable question. To me, it's not the matter of me arguing with you, it's a matter that neither one of us have the data. So let's get the data and then we can find out. Like with the IUDs, uh, our injectables also at Ethiopia, you know, decided, uh, you know, did the studies to show H that. Henry, uh, will you come with us to USAID to help advocate for funding for this research? <laughs>
Good. We'll, we'll form a campaign. We'll get everybody, you know, all the denominations marching on USA, carrying flags. To the <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> did, did everybody get one of the evaluation forms, too? I want to make sure that everybody did before we break up. But uh, other questions, comments? We have a, a few more minutes, if anyone wants. Yes, yes, one more. Uh, this conference is very rewarding. Uh, I keep talking because my country, where I come from, Liberia, the poverty rate is very high. It's because people are not planning. And so uh, I'm representing channel, Christian HIV and AIDS Network of Liberia. And I happen to be one of the board members. We are nine. And two board members are here in this conference. And we have learned a lot that we can take a message to our community through channel. Because channel is in, uh, involved with a lot of churches. And so to get the message across, when we get to the churches, it's easy. Because channel is dealing with churches. And then um, we have a lot of churches registering for, to be a member of channel, Christian HIV and AIDS Network. And then when we are networking with them, and then we want to implement any project that has to do with family planning, how to help our people to reduce the poverty rate, and through CCRH, it's going to be well for our country. We are, that's why we are hoping and we are praying that this project we can cook, uh, in, uh, network with CCRH. That's why we have come. We are two board members. We are six from Liberia representing channel. And we are all here, and we'll be going back with a message. But I, I'm really, I want to say, uh, this conference is very rewarding. All the sections, the yesterday I was in one that presented on marriage, uh, it, was, it was very rewarding. He just emailed me into my box with that note, and I really need it. We need that. And the, in this presentation this morning, too, we need it. It will help us. The next conference is going to be, you have a good result from Liberia. I promise that God bless you Here, in God, Jesus' name. God bless you. And, and you have blessed us uh, with your words. Thank you so kindly. Uh, yes. Thank you. I just want to go back to the issue of the mobile apps. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I'm wondering if there would be cultural issues uh, or issues of privacy, that people would be hesitant to, you know, use that kind of application for uh, these kind of issues. I I'm not sure how exactly it works, but I'm just wondering about the cultural privacy issues on that. Thanks. That's a really good question. And before we launch the CycleTel app in any, so right now it's currently in India, and we did a lot of formative research to understand these very issues, um, specifically what the text message said what characters it used, whether it was Hinglish, Hindi, English, what level of literacy the women had to have, and also what their preferences were about whether or not the man you know, owned the phone, was he the one receiving the text messages, or was the woman receiving it? So all of these issues need to be sorted out before the application can be launched in the specific context. And that, that's exactly what we're looking into right now. Hopefully in Kenya. So stay tuned. There's more to come. And, and yes, it, you know, simple things turn out to be a little bit more complex when you start thinking about them and applying them uh, in the field. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes? Any? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Jean-Jacques. I'm, I'm a public health physician. I was working recently with the Schweizer Foundation in Lambarini. Uh, the, I didn't get you. <laughs> yes, uh, I say my name is Jean-Jacques. I'm a public health physician. I was working until recently with the Schroeder Hospital in Lombardy. My question is to Lauren. I was wondering how much uh, cultural belief interfere with the SDN. I'm talking uh, principally about uh, polygamous society because working in r rural area, uh, I have to educate people about uh, standard methods. And many women were reluctant in using because they thought that if they do not uh, accept sex, 
your husband might go with another woman. Uh, many of them was really written in using uh, the preferred pills and all. Yeah. No, I mean, if the couple has that particular issue where the woman cannot refuse sex, then the standardized method would not be appropriate for her. I mean, we do encourage that if couples can negotiate and use condoms on fertile days, then they should go ahead and do that. But if that's not an option for her, then um, the, the, the counselor should be providing her another method that works well for her. Definitely. I was just wondering about the efficacy of the, oh, I'm, I'm Marie Moss and I'm here with Food Resource Bank. And I'm just wondering about the efficacy of the, of the rhythm method. Is it, does it work in rural settings like this? Sure, and I have plenty of information for anyone who wants to take some of the hard copies back, like the peer-reviewed journal articles and whatnot. I do want to first make a distinction between rhythm method and standard days method, because uh -huh. for a method to be modern, it needs to be scientifically tested with clinical trials and whatnot. The standard days method has had that rigorous research. Rhythm method has not. So the effectiveness of the standard days method with perfect use is 95%. But as with most user-dependent methods, the typical rate is lower. It's 88%, which is roughly comparable to that of pills and condoms as well. Yeah, in the US, for example, the, the pregnancy rate for pills um, is eight women out of 100 in the first year. With cycle beads, it's 12. With the condom, it's 16. So it, it kind of actually fits in there pretty well. It, it, this is in typical use for those of us who are not perfect in. Uh, <laughs> and following the rules. <laughs> yes. Okay. Are we ready to close? Great. Well, thank you all very much for a, a great session, and thanks to our three speakers who did a, a great job. <laughs>